Good day, Joe. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Guy, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Now, you and I have not met until just a few minutes ago. We've, we've, we've been uh, connected on social media for a number of years now, but uh, this is our first time meeting here. Now, I have sent you the questions in advance, so uh, just so our audience knows that uh, you've had a chance to prepare for this. But let's start off with my four-part introductory questions here. So to start, can you introduce yourself and tell us um, where you grew up? Yeah. So actually, um, I grew up all over the place. My dad was in the U.S. Air Force. So we lived in Germany, we lived in Australia, Texas, Illinois, Massachusetts, North Carolina, and Utah. So probably the closest thing I can call home is Texas, because that's where my parents were from. So certainly we visited there a lot, but um, no real home. I went to three different high schools, as an example, you know, as part of the time in the military. So now I guess Wisconsin truly is my home because I've been here for a lot of years. Aha. So where did you go to school and what did you study? Uh, well, I went to undergraduate at Northeastern University, which is in Massachusetts. Uh, my father had retired, went to school there, and I studied communications and human resource management. And then I had enough of the Northeast and the cold weather, and I headed back down to Texas and got my master's in adult and technical education at Texas State University. So you, uh, let's talk a little bit about what you, uh, where you live and what you're doing right now. Sure. So right now I am the director of training and development for the CJK group, which is really a large organization with a number of smaller organizations underneath it in the printing and publishing business. And I still live in Wisconsin, just northwest of Milwaukee. So let's talk about uh, from college in Texas, where you got your master's degree. And what's your career progression been? Can you share with us? you know, who you work for, what your jobs were, and, and kind of give us that, uh, tell us about that journey. Absolutely. So after college, I spent a couple of years working in a number of different universities in higher education, doing human resources and communications work. Um, then met my wife. We were both working at Cornell University in New York, followed her back to Wisconsin, which I don't know that I could have pointed out on a map where Wisconsin was at that time, but she was worked the following back and left higher education and entered corporate learning and development. So you've been there uh, for how long? So I entered corporate learning and development back in 98. And I was working at the time for a Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company, which was really probably that first impactful experience I had with learning and development. And the reasoning behind that was the, our director at the time, uh, e-learning and learning management systems were just now starting to come into the mainstream. And so she basically stood up in front of a meeting and said, we want to start utilizing these tools. Do I have a volunteer? And I was that kid in the candy store. So I volunteered, you know, because I certainly embraced technology. And so I got the opportunity to really research e-learning offering tools, learning management systems, audio, video, learning AICC and SCORM back in the day. And so <clears throat> as the use of those tools grew, I just got to experience more and more of that, researching and testing those, eventually wound up growing the team underneath me, become a team leader and eventually manager, managing all those tools that the organization was using. Thank you. After that, I actually joined. Oh. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. No, no, no. Please go. Continue. Um, so after about um, roughly 10 years with Northwestern Mutual, I got an opportunity to work for NASA. So I went down to NASA and worked with their human performance group. So that was human performance, technology, design, and computer interaction. And I was really grateful for that guy um, because... All the use of e-learning and the learning management system and stuff I had been doing before had moved me away from performance improvement. Um, you know, now we were just only focused on learning and how we were delivering learning. And we weren't really asking, is this actually doing anything on the back end with regards to performance improvement? Well, at NASA, everything that we did was human-centered. How are they now working with these technologies, with these tools, with these resources? And how is that improving their overall performance? So that helped me switch my mindset back to what was truly important was performance improvement. And then I went back into corporate learning for a number of different organizations. But the mindset had shifted at that point. I was working in technology at that point. And now they were implementing the use of design thinking and uh, lean startup and agile, which again, is human-centered focus. So now I had a different method of how to go about now designing and delivering learning within those methodologies. Thank you. 
Um, so let me shift gears here now a little bit. Uh, you, you've talked about performance improvement. Now, I've been calling the series uh, HPT videos or some name similar to that. It's shifted a little bit over, over the years since I started in 2008. But uh, can you share with us uh, uh, your first exposure to what I'm calling HPT, human performance technology, otherwise known as performance improvement, performance technology, human performance. It goes by a variety of names, but what was your first exposure to this? Um, so my first exposure was actually coming out of high school and I joined the military. Um, and I'll tell you at the time that my drill sergeant certainly didn't call it HPT or any of those things. Uh, what he called it kind of rhymed with bass fishing. Um, and so it was one of those experiences that I didn't know at the time what it was what we were actually doing. Um, but I had the opportunity, of course, when I went to college, now I was actually exposed to people like B.F. Skinner, for instance, and some other uh, well-known individuals, Frederick Taylor, and got to see through their studies, through their work, what it was that the military was actually applying to us when we were in basic training and, and when we were in our uh, occupational status. So I got to reflect back on that and say, okay, there was something to their, their madness, so to speak, in the way that they were training us. There was intentional purpose. So in graduate school, I got to meet one of your, uh, I got to introduce to one of your favorites, which is Gary Romer. Uh, and how he utilized his studies, his research with the use of adult learning and occupation with regards to different performance technologies. So it was really those combination of experiences and my own personal experience that really resonated with me what they were actually doing and, and the importance of HPT within adult learning. I didn't quite know that you were a rumblerite uh, like uh, some of us, uh, but that's that's, it. that's nice to know. Uh, uh, anyway, so we'll we'll we'll. Let's, let's talk a little bit about who are some of the others who early in your career influenced you. Later on, we'll get to some of the more recent uh, influences and, and who you might be learning from. But, but let's go back to the very beginning to share this with our audience so that the, we can identify for them people or books or articles, other resources that they might find of interest. So absolutely. Let's so yeah. Coming out of college, uh, coming out of graduate school, I should say, it was really the work of Taylor and Skinner and Romer as an example that really kind of set me on my way with regards to how I was approaching learning and development. And then around that time, Stephen Covey came out with the seven habits of highly effective people. So that had an impact on me as well, because the practices, the methods that he was um, promoting really tied into the work of those other great researchers. So I was able to now integrate some of that mindset, you know, beginning with the end in mind, seeking first to understand and things like that. Uh, Dr. Ruth Clark, again, I think one of your favorites as well, has obviously had an impact on me. Dr. Todd Conklin over at the uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, and a lot of the work that he's been doing for probably the past 30 plus years now. Um, in addition to um, Dr. Gustafson and Bob Mosher. So those have probably been, in addition to yourself, the people who have impacted me the most with regards to HPT and performance improvement. Well, thank you. Let's shift gears slightly here. So if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech, so to provide an example to our audience of how you might uh, uh, succinctly uh, describe what it is that you do, you think right. you're giving us your 30 second elevator speech? Yeah, so a lot of times what I explain to CEOs and this kind of came about when I was a consultant was is that my work is really about determining the performance output desired by the organization and the why behind that. Because again, that's that strategic alignment that we're always talking about. It's also determining the competencies that are needed to achieve those worthy outputs and the ecosystems that needed that support, that entire that performance improvement um, environment that they actually need to continually improve themselves and the outputs of the actual organization. So what I do in relationship to that is I'm now determining what are the best methods and practices to achieve that outcome. So I'm not sticking with necessarily a, a, that one and done type of course or workshop. I'm looking at their workflow and saying, okay, how do I now deliver those resources within their workflow that makes it valuable to them as they're actually continuing to improve it? Thank you. So as a lifelong learner, can you share with us what your current focus or next focus is for learning? And are you uh, working out loud, sharing that, writing about it in any way that you could uh, also tell us about? 
Absolutely. Um, so probably what, what I'm reading right now is uh, Brain Rules by Dr. John Medina. And uh, it's had a real big impact on me because Dr. Medina kind of has gone through the process of explaining that we really don't know how we learn, you know, that the science around that is still relatively young. And so we have some educated best guesses, but there's still a whole lot more to be learned in that. And so it helps me to reflect upon is that there's still a whole lot out there with regards to how people learn and therefore performance improvement that we don't understand. And there's something that he said, there's a quote that I actually share with people when they ask about that work, and is that the human brain appears to be um, designed to solve problems in an unstable, and unstable environment for their survival, all right, in constant motion. And that quote is actually how I talk about performance improvement, because that's truly how we're learning is in work, you know? So as we're moving, as we're doing work, that's actually how we're learning those challenges that actually come up. Uh, my next book is actually by Dr. Adam Grant, and that's called Think Again. And so that's about a, probably a topic that's much more relevant to a lot of people today is that it's about relearning and unlearning old things in order to now learn new things as well. And I try to write about that at least, if not weekly, certainly every other week on LinkedIn. I try to share articles that I'm writing as well as you and Bob Mosher and other people are writing as well to again, grow that environment that I'm actually working in and try to get other people who have actually resonated to some of those articles that, that you've written, that Bob has written, that I've written, um, to get on board with the idea of performance improvement. Thank you. Let's uh, shift now to something about uh, our language or terminology. My question is, is there a performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued by others and you want to put your own spin on it. What, Absolutely. what phrase might you have? Well, I would tell you it's kind of more of a rant uh, than a phrase or a statement. And really it's that I've never met a CEO. I've never talked to a CEO who cared as much about learning as they did about performance improvement and results. And so that message from that CEO, that organization is very loud and clear. Here's what we value. And it seems like, and I'm certainly guilty of this, we kind of go back to the whole learning piece and, and fail to recognize what it is that they're actually telling us is important in that regard. So that's why I kind of get frustrated with vendors and consultants and, and the like who are talking about, uh, here's how you can now improve your learning. Here's how you can strategically align because that message is already loud and clear in our organizations. We just now have to figure out how to like get to that point. And as you've often said, um, Guy, it's really about performance of worthy outputs. So now that we know or understand what those worthy outputs are and how they align to the organization's goal and vision, then that's where our focus should be. And that really is within the workflow in and of itself. So when I talk to people about this, that's what I try to be very clear about is that you already know what it is they want. They're very clear about it. And you're just going to focus on that piece. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's amazing. This came up just the other day here as to, you know, why hasn't this gotten more traction? I mean, people were talking about this, you know, 20 years before I got into the business in 79. And, and so it's been a, it's been frustrating to people. I remember Joe Harless, the late Joe Harless complaining about this and Rumler complaining about this and Bob Mager complaining about this. And why isn't this catching on? And I think it's because it's hard work and we need to do the upfront analysis and they're, they're, everybody's in too much of a hurry to get it right the first time. So, yeah. and then because we don't measure things on the back end, we don't prove or disprove our methods and what we've produced as being worthy. So right. I, I like that, that worthy outputs is of course from Tom Gilbert, uh, who also called outputs accomplishments uh, kind of the same thing, but they have to be worthy. They have to meet what I think are the stakeholder requirements and all that. You're absolutely right. Thank you for uh, sharing that. So, so let's explore now some of the people, again, to provide uh, pointers to our audience, people that have more recently been influential into your thinking and your practices as a performance improvement uh, person. Absolutely. So actually, this journey for me really started back in 2006. Uh, I happened to have been fortunate enough to attend a conference and Bob Mosher was speaking. And at that time, he had now made that transition to the five moments of need. And that really changed my entire direction, right? So I started thinking about things differently. The NASA experience came along. And then that's when I really started going back to the basics that we talked about prior to that. 
More recently, besides yourself, obviously the wonderful host of this show, uh, David James and Nick Shackleton Jones, uh, both coming out of England, have a whole lot to say around, you know, you've got to move beyond that learning mindset to performance improvement in the practice. Heather McGowan, who actually, and I don't know if you've had the opportunity to read her, she's written a number of articles of that difference between education and learning and has some great imagery behind that. It really emphasizes that learning is just this kind of repetitive constant up and down cycle. It's not linear the way that we've always built learning in the past. Um, Dr. Adam Grant, Dr. John Medina that I talked about earlier. Um, there's a Harvard professor, Dr. Amy Edmondson, who's had a lot of influence on me as well. So she comes at uh, learning from a design engineering experience. So she has a lot of different insight into the way that we can go about designing learning with regards to that. And then I talk about, for instance, some of my most recent peers, Jesse Amelie, Linda Reynolds. And if I threw in some outside resources, Scott Galloway, who's a professor of marketing and business at New York University. But now he's, a, he's not a PhD. He's actually an entrepreneur that set up a number of businesses, scaled them up, and then sold them off. And there's a woman by the name of Whitney Johnson who talks about the S curve of learning. So you, know, you get this experience, it comes down, and it keeps going like this. And so those are some of the people that really had an impact on me with regards to staying on this path of performance improvement. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, I hope that our audience can uh, will take advantage of this and uh, and look these people up and see what they have to offer because there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people doing really great work here. But uh, uh, and they're all oriented to terminal performance, uh, yes. which is should be our objective uh, from a learning and development standpoint. Absolutely, Joe. Thank you so much for uh, participating in this. Uh, interview. For, my final question to you is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially those new to the field, related to all things performance improvement? Yeah, uh, I would encourage everyone to remember that performance improvement of worthy outputs is the true north. It is the measure. I mean, and that's very clear from the CEO and the organization. Once you kind of get past the vision and their objectives, you really start to see what those measures are. And they generally are always associated with some type of performance improvement. And so, you know, if there's truth in the, the course of workshop that only 10% of what people need to know to do their job is learned in those courses of workshops, then we need to understand that and probably spend a lot less time worrying about the 10% and more time focused on that 70-20, right? So where is that learning within the workflow now? So, so I'm asking all of your viewers, uh, as I do anybody that I'm connected with, to do themselves a favor, you know, when they see those articles, those webinars, you know, the, the, the pitches to come to a workshop, to really ask, is this practice, is this tool, is this whatever it is, going to actually help improve performance within my organization? And much to the points of a lot of your articles, DPI, it's asking those questions of, okay, well, where was that research done? What is this article about? You know, those kind of things, because as someone who has spent a lot of time working in manufacturing, a lot of those things are not manufacturing based. They're probably much more technology or finance, as an example, which is great, but I don't, there's not a lot of a cohesion with regards to where I work versus what they actually worked on. And I wish those people, those authors, those vendors would actually talk about where that research, that work was actually done. So you can make an assessment of how do I now align this to the work that I'm doing, for instance, in retail or hospitality, it's a much different environment. So I'm encouraging all your viewers, uh, those people who don't know you, to follow you, to connect with you, to connect with Bob Mosher, all right? And to really get out there and just understand what competencies are, what performance improvement is all about. Because once you have a clear understanding of that, it will really change your direction of what the work that you're doing, which I think leads to, again, value because you're now helping to focus on those work outputs. Thank you again, Joe, so much for participating in this interview with me today. Have oh, it's been my pleasure, guys. All right, bye-bye. Bye now.